Hi, welcome to Real Progressives. This is MMT Mondays, Macro Mondays. I love the alliteration. This is a new program on Real Progressives where we're going to be rebroadcasting uh, old speeches, uh, old content from MMT creators, Stephanie Kelton, Warren Mosler, Randy Ray, Pavlina Chernova, Fidel Kaboob, Stephen Hale. Uh, and we want to be able to share this with you. We want to be able to make sure the information gets out there, that it's fresh, uh, that new eyes uh, start looking at it because MMT is really hitting the mainstream. Uh, it's really making an impact in media. It's really making an impact in people's lives as they realize uh, that we've been lied to for 50 years about how the economy works and really opening up the conversation about what is really possible. What can we accomplish uh, with the economy? What can we accomplish with our society? What is truly affordable? Uh, so join us every Monday. Uh, the first one is a video that I made. Uh, I'm not an MT economist. I am not an economist at all. Uh, but I wanted to be able to make something uh, that would really help to explain the bare bones basics in a way that was accessible, in a way that anyone would be able to get a new way of thinking. And that's the whole purpose of this, uh, of this video that you're about to see today. It is a new way of thinking. Some things are intentionally left simplified so as not to complicate the issue while still at the same time being completely accurate. Uh, when you're done watching this video, join us again next Monday. We will be starting off with Stephanie Kelton, Angry Birds. Uh, just really join us every week. Uh, at the end of the credits, you know, I'll be here to say a few more things about what you just have seen. So join us right here every Monday on Real Progressives. We're going to be rebroadcasting something really important from one of the MMT economists. Everyone from Stephanie Kelton to Warren Mosler to Fidel Kaboob to Pavlina Chernova and everyone in between. Right now, sit back and enjoy an intro to MMT. The rules of the house that were passed under which we would function said we will pay as we go. No deficit spending. This nation is broke. But the major change is coming because the country technically is in bankruptcy. from the Mercatus Center finds Senator Sanders' Medicare for All plan would cost over $32 trillion, that's trillion, over the next 10 years. And doubling all federal tax revenue still wouldn't be enough to pay. by the rules. You'll get ahead. That's what we were all told. And we used to believe it too, when we were young. But now that we've grown, we can see something far different from that reality all around us. And it's causing a lot of problems, a lot of pain. And it's making a lot of people very angry. You want to change that? Great! How? How will you do it? How will you change that? I ask because people have been trying to change that for a long time and gotten nowhere. So where do you start? Well, a helpful place to start is to ask why. Why are people working more but getting less? Why are more families struggling to provide just the essentials for themselves and their children? Why do they have to put more of their monthly expenses on credit cards, bank loans, or payday loans? 
Why have healthcare costs gone so far out of control, resulting in millions of needless bankruptcies, homelessness, and death, but our elected officials do little to nothing about it, and they continue to get elected? Or, on the off chance that an incumbent is dethroned, they get replaced by someone just as bad? Why is there so much unemployment? All the time, and worse, underemployment. People working multiple part-time jobs, working longer hours than previous generations, all while getting worse pay and few, if any, benefits. Why is there so much fierce competition for preschools? Forget about high school or even college. Preschools? For that matter, why should there be so much competition to get into any level of education? It seems that more and more you have to be accomplished by the age of six or your entire future is in jeopardy. How is even a perception like this existing, let alone the reality of it? Why are we fighting more concurrent wars than can be counted on the fingers of one hand, all while creating the conditions that lead to refugees crossing borders as we criminalize them for wanting a better life, free from the conditions our government helped create in the first place? As the old saying goes, why can't we have nice things? America has become an economic bipolar country with enough opulence to make Caligula blush right next to such abject poverty you would think you had just traveled to a third world country. Is there something wrong with us? Or is there something wrong with our government and our economic system? Was it always wrong? What happened? For 30 years after World War II, wages in this country rose with GDP. The working people got to share in the prosperity that they helped create. But in the land of the free, the home of the brave, overseen by Lady Liberty herself, how was it permissible that, although GDP continued to rise substantially over the next 40 years, more and more Americans have not had their wages increased? For most of that time, it was the top 20% who would get all the benefits, while the majority of Americans suffered but now it's only the top 1% getting almost everything. Why? What went wrong? In those 40 years, we've all been told the same story. Government is not the answer to your problems. Government is the problem. Government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. The American people can't spend money it doesn't have. That's unsustainable. Well, you can't expect the federal government to do any less. The debt and the deficit are unsustainable. We can't keep borrowing money from China. That's irresponsible. Our children and grandchildren will have to pay this back. It's immoral. Seriously, you don't believe me? Well, don't take my word for it. When are we going to get serious, Candy, about the debt? We got to deal with this big long-term debt problem or it will deal with us. But the nonpartisan committee for a responsible federal budget says, Secretary Clinton, under your plan, debt would rise to 86% of GDP over the next 10 years. Mr. Trump, under your plan, they say it would rise to 105% of GDP over the next 10 years. Question is, why are both of you ignoring this problem? And there's a good news that there's a consensus to really reduce this uh, debt. Um, by $4 trillion over 10 years or 12 years, but that's a pretty good consensus and that's a deep number. And that's the problem. Our country is technically bankrupt, but it's very simple. The government works like your house works. Our government has promised far more money than it actually has or probably ever will have. We have to live within our means. We have to reduce our deficit and we have to get back on a path that will allow us to pay down our debt. Uh, as we know, $14 trillion in debt is no light matter. We have got to solve the debt crisis in this country, and we have got to demonstrate some responsibility here in Washington so this economy can get going again. We understand America is broke. 
What is this building up deficits, heaping mountains of debt on the next generation? Not a good idea. And uh, so there is an urgent need for us to contain the growth of the deficit. Our free stuff today is being paid for by taking money from our children and borrowing from China. Our rising debt levels poses a national security threat, and it poses a national security threat in two ways. Um, it undermines our capacity to act uh, in our own interests, and it uh, does constrain us where uh, constraint may be undesirable. The Congressional Budget Office projected in April that the Republican tax law would add nearly $1.9 trillion to the deficit from 2018 to 2028. 2.7 trillion dollars does a great deal to reduce our debt burden. As to how you would go about tackling the deficit problem in this country. I think it's not just an economic issue. I think it's a moral issue. I think it's frankly not moral for my generation to keep spending massively more than we take in, knowing those burdens are going to be passed on to the next generation. And they're going to be paying the interest and the principal all their lives. And the amount of debt we're adding at a trillion a year is simply not moral. It is to take out a credit card from the Bank of China in the name of our children, driving up our national debt. So that we now have over $9 trillion of debt that, that we are going to have to pay back. $30,000 for every man, woman, and child. That's irresponsible. It's unpatriotic. We're broke. We're broke. America's broke. And yet, it all takes money. You know the numbers, $1.7 trillion debt, a national deficit of $11 trillion. At what point do we run out of money? Well, uh, we, we're out of money now. Money now, 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 money now. So America is out of money. The president told us so. Surely he must know. Surely our elected leaders wouldn't lie to us, would they? Well, saying we're out of money sure makes it sound like the U.S. government is just another corporation looking to make a buck, looking to make a financial profit off of its spending. Or they're just like us, having to earn or borrow dollars in order to pay for things, and looking for change in the couch cushions to be able to do so. But when we look under the cushions, it's to pay for snacks. They act like they're doing it to be able to pay for things like Medicare and Social Security. But they're U.S. dollars, aren't they? How can the U.S. government run out of U.S. dollars? Where do they come from? Most people get them from their paychecks. But where did the company get them from? Their clients. Okay, so where did they get them from? Who actually creates the dollar? Does anyone know? Has anyone asked? Well, I did. And I'm far from the only one who has. In fact, I'm the very least of those who have. But where to start? Well, first, I talked to some friends of mine. People who knew, like I did, that something was rotten in Washington. But who also knew things I did not. People like John Lancelot and Steve Grumbine of Real Progressives picked me up and threw me down the rabbit hole. They were not the experts but they sent me to the ones who were. So I did a lot of reading. I read papers and articles and watched videos by PhD economists like Stephanie Kelton, Randall Ray, Pavlina Chernova, Bill Mitchell, Stephen Hale, Fidel Kaboob, Matthew Forstater, and Scott Fulweiler. Also by leading economic experts like Ellis Winningham, Warren Mosler, Mike Norman, Joe Firestone, and Rohan Gray. I also absorbed information from organizations like Deficit Owls, Modern Money Network, New Economic Perspectives, and Real Progressives. Did I do it because I thought it was fun? Hell no! I did it because something was horribly wrong in the world, and the more I read, the more convinced I was that this was the missing piece. This was what had gone wrong. Our economy fundamentally changed 47 years ago, and no one told the people. What am I talking about? What is the answer? Well, it turns out that the answer is quite simple. 
contained in one of this country's most prized documents, the Constitution. Man, the Republicans love to talk about the Constitution, especially when they want to restrain presidential power, unless that president is a Republican. Sometimes I think they got rid of the fairness doctrine because they hate that word. Fairness. <laughs> But it turns out that the Constitution has a lot to say on the issue of currency. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution states, among other things, three important aspects of our U.S. dollar. Number 1. Congress, and only Congress, shall create the currency, meaning no one else can do it. Not you, not me, not any state government, corporation, or bank. Any bank. Even the Federal Reserve. What banks do is something else. Only Congress can create the national currency. If you try to create U.S. dollars, that's called counterfeiting. I'll see you when you get out of prison, say in about 20 years. Once again, Congress creates the currency. Number two, Congress sets the value of money, meaning they tell you what one U.S. dollar is worth. They used to promise to exchange their currency for a certain amount of gold. We call this the gold standard. But President Nixon took us off the gold standard once and for all in 1971. So now one US dollar is worth what? Well, nothing in and of itself, but it does have value because number three, Congress shall levy taxes denominated in their own currency, meaning you now need US dollars. Let's face it. If you wanted to, you could barter for whatever you want or need. It would be a pain in the ass, for you would need to meet the coincidence of need, finding someone who has what you need, who also needs what you have. And to meet all your needs, that would likely be several people you would need to find. But it is possible, and that is the point. No one is forcing you to use US dollars to purchase goods and services. There is no law that says you must use U.S. dollars to purchase anything. There is, however, a tax obligation that everyone has. And the U.S. government will not extinguish your tax obligation in any currency other than U.S. dollars. You will not be able to offer goods and services for that. If you fail to come up with U.S. dollars for your taxes, then they will garnish your wages. They will confiscate your property. They will punish you. Why? It's not because they need the cash. They created it in the first place. And they can just create more. No, they will punish you because they need you to need their currency. That's it. If you don't need their currency, then you won't demand it. And demand drives value. It's not the only reason they tax, but it is the first and most important reason. So, from a practical perspective, what does all this mean? It means that everyone is in the same boat of needing U.S. dollars. That includes you, me, corporations, small businesses, municipalities, and states. So, you will not accept a job that doesn't pay in U.S. dollars. You will not accept goods and services for anything other than U.S. dollars. Why? Because everyone owes taxes and is only payable in U.S. dollars. You don't want to go to jail? Then pay up in U.S. dollars. It also means that, since we are no longer on a gold standard anymore, the federal government doesn't need your taxes to fund its spending at all. It creates its own currency. It can create as much of it as it needs to in order to fund its programs. Its restriction is no longer a fiscal problem. It's a resource problem. And we live in one of the richest resource countries on the planet. But more on that in a moment. Still, people think that taxation is theft. No, it's not theft. You're buying something with your money. You might not be buying it willingly or directly as you would a tangible good or service, but you are purchasing something. Well, yeah, but I don't want to do it at all. It's not right. They're threatening me with prison. Yes, and what do you get out of all this coercion, out of all this threat of prison? What are you buying with your taxes if you're not buying specific items? Well, let's see. Everyone needs U.S. dollars now, 
so everyone will accept U.S. dollars in exchange for goods and services. The federal government does not need your dollars as revenue or as an income to be able to spend, but your taxes creating the needed value for the U.S. dollar allows the federal government to be able to spend. In other words, they don't need your money. They need you to need their money. So, Don Pardo, please tell our angry citizen what he actually gets in exchange for his taxes. Well, Jeff, he's getting a functioning economy, a civil society. He'll get roads, schools, hospitals, police, emergency first responders, a standing army, not to mention water and electricity right to his home. And a whole lot more. He can get everything he needs to live and thrive. Wow. Not a bad deal. If you can keep it. And yet we're always led to believe that we need rich people in order to afford things. But rich people and companies don't make the U.S. dollar. The Constitution is very clear on that. As former chief economist on the U.S. Senate Budget Committee and economic advisor to the 2016 Bernie Sanders presidential campaign, Professor Stephanie Kelton says, Money doesn't grow on rich people. So when a sovereign government that has complete control over its currency is first formed, how does anyone ever get federal currency to spend if no one has them but the government? Glad you asked. The good news is that the government needs stuff to function. As Don Pardo said, it needed roads, bridges, buildings, schools, a military, railroads, and a whole host of other things. And it needed real resources to create these things. Not money, real resources, real stuff. Now, it could either press its citizens into service for all of these things, or it could pay them. In the modern era, governments choose to pay. So government goes to all the skilled labor entrepreneurs and business leaders and gives them government contracts. The government spends money into existence, into the economy first. Now people have federal dollars to pay their taxes with. <laughs> Not everybody. If you weren't a business or already working for that business or were in any way without a government contract, you were now, what, what? You guessed it. Unemployed! Congratulations! You now need a job or you get nothing! Amongst the first things governments all over the world created was unemployment. They did it by creating a national currency, setting its value, and then creating all the demand for that currency they will ever need by enforcing a tax obligation denominated in that currency. But if all this is true, then why do so many people think that the federal government requires their tax dollars to finance its spending? Because there was a time when it did. When we were on the gold standard. When the U.S. government decided, see, decided, political choice, ah, to peg its dollar to gold, then they were financially constrained. They had to make sure that they didn't spend more money into existence than they had in gold reserves. Because what they were telling you was that they would promise to exchange the dollars you earned for a certain amount of gold. And if everyone chose to honor that exchange at the same time, the government had better have the gold on hand to keep up their end of that promise. Put simply, if the U.S. only had 100 billion pounds of gold in reserves and Congress fixed the value of the U.S. dollar at $1 to one pound of gold, that's a very expensive dollar, but let's just keep the math simple, just for demonstration's sake. Then they could only put $100 billion of currency into the economy and still be able to meet their promise to exchange dollars for gold at a fixed price. Now let's take this scenario a little further. So, under this system, if the government wanted to deficit spend, spend more than they expected to get back in taxes, and this spending would lead to increasing the money supply beyond what we had in gold reserves, then they would have two choices. Either increase the gold supply or tax and borrow existing dollars to spend. Increasing the gold supply can be a tricky situation as the availability may just not be there. 
It is a finite commodity after all. So if that's not an option, then they would have to use tax dollars to spend on programs. So if the gold supply from this example had been valued at $100 billion, but the federal government wanted or needed to spend $120 billion on various government programs, and they were not able to increase the supply of gold, then they could use $20 billion of tax revenue to help pay for it. By spending this tax money back into the economy, they would maintain a consistent, stable money supply. Technically, in this scenario, $120 billion had been spent, but since $20 billion of it had already been created in the past, there's still only $100 billion of currency in circulation. The gold reserves and the money supply still match up. So, under such a system, taxes could be needed to spend. But what if Congress wanted to, or needed to, spend even more than that? Well, they could only tax so much without destroying the economy. And if they taxed at a 100% rate across the board, then no one would be left with any money. But they can borrow. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution gives Congress the ability to borrow on the faith and credit of the U.S. government. So, if they needed more revenue or spendable currency than they could safely tax, and all without exceeding their gold supply, then they could sell treasury securities. They could go to everyone in the private sector, domestically or internationally, that had excess U.S. dollars, cash on hand that they weren't doing anything with, and sell them treasury bonds, and promise to repay them with interest when the bond matures. And that's free money for you! Yay! And it still uses existing U.S. dollars. Remember that only the U.S. government can create the U.S. dollar. No one else is creating new U.S. dollars and lending it to the federal government so they can spend them. That doesn't happen now, and it never did. No, every dollar that the U.S. government borrowed were dollars they themselves had already created and spent into the economy. But by borrowing and spending previously created money, the money supply again remains stable and equal to the existing gold supply. The government can now use these dollars to fund federal spending. If they're smart, then they use the money from those bonds to invest in the economy with an aim to increasing the tax base so they can pay the bonds back with the promised interest. That was when we were on a gold standard. That is the context for believing that taxes and borrowing are needed for federal spending. Because it was. Then. But what about now? Well, we're not on a gold standard anymore. As I mentioned, President Nixon took us off the gold standard in 1971. The federal government no longer promises to exchange your earned U.S. dollars for gold. If we no longer have to defend a gold supply, there is no longer a fixed amount of currency that can be in circulation at any one time. Our currency is now fiat, meaning at will. The federal government now decides the size of the money supply, with no regard to the existence of a finite commodity like gold. The U.S. government is no longer fiscally constrained, tied to the supply of a commodity. They are resource constrained, tied to the availability of real resources. What they can and cannot do is constrained by the amount of real resources available to do whatever project they have in mind. For example, if they wanted to do single-payer health care, the question should not be, how much will that cost? Or the ever-present ubiquitous, how you gonna pay for that? That sets up a mindset that believes that there is a dollar value above which the government says, nope, I simply don't have the money for that. But that is simply untrue. It would be true for you, a currency user, but it is never true for a currency issuing government with a sovereign, free-floating, non-convertible fiat currency. Ever. Cost is never the deciding issue. The question should be, do we have the real resources in concrete, steel, labor, and other supplies to build the hospitals and clinics that we would need? 
Do we have the doctors, nurses, medical staff, pharmaceutical companies ready to dispense the needed medications and medical manufacturing companies ready to provide the needed equipment? All to provide everything for the medical needs of the entire population. If the answer is yes, then the government simply needs to make payments and get it done. If the answer is no, then the question becomes, can we marshal our resources to secure these things? If the answer is yes, then the federal government marshals its resources and secures them for this purpose. Perhaps it's a question of there not being enough construction companies available at the moment to secure the contracts to build all of the needed hospitals and clinics. Perhaps that will mean securing their labor as their existing contracts expire, or providing federal funds for more education to produce more engineers and architects, or a combination of these and other factors. Perhaps it means we don't have enough doctors and nurses available to treat the large influx of expected patients. So we'll have to train more or allow them to come in from other countries. So all this might translate into, well, we can't have it right now, but we will slowly bring it online. It should take five to 10 years to get all of the needed pieces into place, but it will be done. And this is how we will start. So the big obstacle was not money, but resources. And all it took to solve it was time. But let's say the answer was still no, we just don't have the resources domestically to get it done. Well, then the question becomes, can we import these needed resources? If the answer is yes, then we do that. So maybe the problem was we didn't have enough raw materials to build the hospitals. So we find who has the materials in excess supply in other countries that we can buy from them, hopefully at a fair price with respect to their economy and their labor force. But that's a different topic for a different video. But if the answer is still no, then and only then will we have our first real stumbling block to achieving what we have in mind. But it's never about it's too expensive. That's the answer of someone who either doesn't understand federal economics or who doesn't want it to happen. But to further illustrate this point, let's let Alan Greenspan, former chairman of the Federal Reserve, answer a question from Paul Ryan as he was testifying before Congress under oath. So having personal retirement accounts is, a, is another way of making a, a future retiree benefits more secure for their retirement. And also, do you believe that personal retirement accounts as a component to a system of solvency does help improve solvency? Because when you have a personal retirement account policy, it, it's accompanied with a benefit offset. With that feature in place, do you believe that personal retirement accounts can help us achieve solvency for the system and make those future retiree benefits more secure? Well, I, I wouldn't say that the uh, pay-as-you-go benefits are insecure in the sense that uh, well, there's nothing to prevent the federal government from creating as much money as it wants and paying it to somebody. The question is, how do you set up a system which assures that the real assets are created which those benefits are employed to purchase? So it's not a question of security. It's a question of the structure of a financial system which assures that the real resources are created for retirement as distinct from the cash. The cash itself is nice to have, but uh, it's got to be in the context of the real resources being created at the time those benefits are paid so that you can purchase real resources with the benefits, which of course are cash. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing preventing the federal government from creating as much money as it wants and paying it to someone. That's a direct quote. The federal government does now, as it always did, create the currency. The difference is that now the government doesn't promise to exchange your US dollars for anything. So again, what is one US dollar worth? One dollar. Yeah, okay, but what is the value of a US dollar? In what sense? Food has value, housing, cars, clothes, these all have value. But US currency has no value in and of itself. It is worth whatever you can buy with it. Its value is derived from your need to have it for payment of your taxes. But that's it. 
But the deficit. Well, the deficit is only the difference between what the government spends in a year versus what it thinks it will get back in taxes. That's it. But if the U.S. creates the currency when it spends and doesn't promise to exchange it for anything, then how is this a problem in and of itself? Answer: It's not. The size of the deficit isn't the issue. Where that money was spent and how much slack we have in the real economy to absorb that money without causing inflation is the real issue. We need to look at the marginal propensity to consume (MPC). Yeah, I know it sounds boring, because it is. Unfortunately, it's important and it's easy to understand. It simply means what is the likelihood of you spending your income and how much of it? Some of it? Most of it? All of it? So, if you're poor, you're more likely to spend almost every dollar that flows through your fingers. Not because you're irresponsible, as many in the GOP would have you believe, but because it takes almost everything you earn to make ends meet. After all, poverty is not a lazy problem; it's an I don't have enough money problem. But if you're fabulously rich, you're not likely to be spending all that money. You're already buying everything you need. You're already buying all the houses and cars you're going to. You're already taking all the vacations you're going to take. You're not going to go out to eat any more often than you already do, and pretty much all of your material needs have already been met. So, what is the likelihood of you spending more income if it came your way, say in the form of a tax break? Not very high, if at all. So when I say it matters where the deficit was spent, I mean, did it do good for the economy? Did it help people? Will it improve the quality of people's lives, all without causing inflation? Was it used to make needed investments in healthcare, infrastructure, education, research and development, and other areas to ensure that we are not only a productive society now, but that we will remain one in the future? If it is used to give massive tax breaks to the already fabulously wealthy, the NPC tells us that GDP will not rise all that much. Wages will not rise, and the poor will not get out of poverty. But inequality will rise. <laughs> But at least inflation won't be a concern, right? Am I right? Am I right? I'm right. Yeah, I'm right. But the debt. Yeah. Yeah, the national debt is simply the entirety of the money supply, all the money that has ever been created, that has yet to be taken back in taxes. This includes all of the treasury bonds as well as all the cash you have on hand. Okay, but don't we have to pay those bonds back? I mean, isn't this a problem burdening our children? No, it no longer works that way. Not off of a gold standard. Not with a fiat currency. But we do still issue bonds, treasury securities, even though we are no longer on a gold standard. Why would we do this? We don't need existing U.S. dollars to be able to spend at the federal level, so why do we do it? Well, the Federal Reserve sells bonds because Congress mandates that they do. The Federal Reserve must, by law, sell bonds sufficient to cover congressional deficit spending. But we don't need the money. But they keep selling them anyway, and we don't need it for spending. So what do we need them for? Well, primarily for three reasons. Number one, Congress demands that the Federal Reserve do so. It's a political choice, not an economic necessity. If you don't like the fact that we sell bonds, then tell Congress to stop mandating that they be sold. Simple. Number two. Instead of selling them so we can spend that money as a means of defending our gold reserves, the Fed will now sell them to defend their target interest rate, and people will buy them because number three, it's free money. If you have enough disposable cash to be able to purchase a treasury security, then when it matures, you get free money in the form of an interest payment. This is called corporate welfare. This not only helps cause inequality, but it exacerbates it as well. But now, since we no longer need taxes to pay for programs, then we also don't need them to pay for the interest on the debt. When you buy a treasury security, the Fed will debit your bank account and transfer it into a savings account at the Fed. Congratulations, you just bought a security. 
when it matures, they debit your securities account and credit your bank account, increasing it with the added earned interest. It's all done with keystrokes on a computer keyboard. No fuss, no muss, and no tax dollars were needed or used, neither to pay back the principal nor to pay the interest. Now, of course, people will be stating that you can't just print more money. That'll devalue the dollar. We'll have massive inflation. Markets will collapse. Hold your horses there. First, we can't devalue the dollar. It doesn't have a value anymore. It is what it is. Fiat, meaning at will. It floats in relative value against other currencies. But it cannot lose domestic value while the federal government retains the ability to enforce a tax in that currency. Second, markets understand that the U.S. and other sovereign nations create their own currency and can never go broke in those currencies. They can never become insolvent or be unable to pay their bills. This is why bond markets didn't collapse during the Great Recession. We lost our AAA credit rating because Congress was playing games and threatening to not pay its bills on purpose, by choice, not because it couldn't pay its bills at all. They are not like a household. They create the dollar and can therefore pay for anything that is for sale in U.S. dollars. We all need to understand the difference between political choices, both good and bad, and macroeconomic reality. Further, international markets won't collapse either. Our currency floats in value relative to other currencies, as they do now, as they have for 45 years, as they will again in the future. We've been up against other currencies and we've been down. How many people noticed? Rich people who vacation in the Swiss Alps will. So will international business people, but no one else will. Now, as for inflation, we first need to understand what that is. It is when the price of all goods and services are observed to rise over time. Not some goods and services, all goods and services. Why individual prices are what they are can be complicated, but goods and services, on the aggregate, being stable, while the cost of ketchup rises, is not inflation. But the cost of everything rising is. Next, we should be specific about what kind of inflation we are talking about. Are we talking about creeping, walking, galloping, or hyperinflation? You must know which you are talking about, as well as the reasons those particular inflations might present themselves. Is the cause demand pull? Meaning we have too many dollars chasing too few goods and services. Or is it cost push? Meaning the supply of a given area of the economy has become scarce. An increase in the money supply, such as with Congress increasing the deficit to cancel student loan debt, pay for college tuition, provide single-payer health care, convert to 100% green energy, or any of a host of other public works projects, always, always carries the possibility of a demand-pull style of inflation. The possibility, not the guarantee. The problem is when people hear inflation in this context, they think about hyperinflation. But what about Zimbabwe? They printed money and it destroyed their economy. No. Their government destroyed their own economy through poorly executed economic reforms and poor leadership. Bad political choices, not macroeconomic realities. When Zimbabwe then at the time called Rhodesia, first declared its unrecognized independence from the UK in 1965, it ushered in an era of oppressive white minority rule. This apartheid state ended in 1980 with the first black majority rule. Despite this, there was still significant inequality in land ownership left over from the old regime. With agriculture being such a huge portion of Zimbabwe's GDP and a major source of employment, it was believed that this disparity had to change. So, in the 1990s, it instituted the Economic Structural Adjustment Program. This included land reforms to evict white landowners and grant the lands to black farmers. Mugabe decided to reward his freedom fighters who had risked their lives to end the previous oppressive regime with the land turning warriors into farmers. 
this may have been good just policy from a social justice standpoint. And it was exactly that. But unfortunately, these new farmers had little to no experience in farming and many of them, while wanting the social reforms, had never actually wanted to become farmers in the first place. So when drought hit, food production plummeted. Couple that with political corruption, cronyism, the collapse of its banking institutions, and the inevitable consequence of rampant unemployment led to its hyperinflation. The Zimbabwean government tried to respond to the worsening situation by printing money. But because their problem was cost push, meaning their productive capacity was decimated, printing money couldn't fix it. All of their political corruption got in the way of every reasonable solution. But all most people see is the printing the money. They don't see the lead up that was the real cause. Okay, but Weimar Germany, they had hyperinflation and you needed buckets of cash just to be able to buy bread. They said smugly? Yes, that happened. But like Zimbabwe, printing money came later. You see, after World War I, Germany had to pay reparations to the winning nations. And they had to do it in debt that was not denominated in their currency. Right there, they lost one of the core pillars of monetary sovereignty. Do not collect debt in a foreign currency. Couple that with their productive capacity being decimated by the war and the land that had been producing for them was then under the control of France and Belgium. So yes, the Weimar Republic printed money to try to compensate. And it failed. Funny though, they turned everything around when Germany stopped paying reparations. No more foreign debt, productive capacity was returning, possibilities abound now. Of course, what they chose to do with those possibilities was rather horrific. But, but again, a devastating catalyst happened before a government had to resort to printing money. It's a cost push problem, not enough real resources. So printing all the money you want doesn't change the situation much. To put it simply, Every case of hyperinflation that has ever happened was due to some kind of catastrophe in the real economy that led to the government printing money to keep up. Hyperinflation has never happened as a result of money creation. Ever. But we could risk walking or even galloping inflation. It's unlikely, but we must be vigilant. We must ensure that as we increase the money supply, or as we deficit spend, that we are a productive enough society to provide goods and services for that money to purchase. Not only now, but in the future. That is the constraint the federal government is under. Resources, not money. We must ask of our government, are we making the kinds of investments in education, healthcare, infrastructure, green energy, new technologies, and new industries to ensure that we are a productive enough society going forward so that all this money we are creating will have goods and services to purchase without significant inflation? Simple? We should never ask, how are you going to pay for that? By now, we should all know the answer for that. It's federal appropriations. Congress must simply create the money, as they do now, and spend it on the programs they choose, as they do now. And you must tell them what those programs must be. So don't ask about the pay-fors. How are you going to pay for that is a trap. The very question is designed to imply that your money is up for grabs to fund the programs in question. Which leads to, I don't want my tax dollars going towards whatever the program is. I mean, take your pick. There's always a federal program that someone doesn't like. Making all of us think that we personally fund all government programs is a great way to get us to fight against them. It sets up a fight that need not exist. If the federal government creates new money every time it spends and needs no revenue at all, let alone any kind of monetary profit from its investments, and is no longer on a currency peg like a gold standard, then it stands to reason that it need not ever raise taxes in order to spend more. It need never cut existing programs in order to spend more. 
taxes may need to be raised for a variety of reasons. Inflation, income inequality, behavior modification, and they can be lowered for the same reasons. But they never need to go up or come down before spending takes place. Ever. The federal government is not like a household. It bears no resemblance to one in any way. Your personal finances, or even those of corporations, municipalities, and states, are the finances of currency users. But the federal government is a currency issuer. As I'm hoping you're beginning to see, the differences between a currency user and a currency issuer and the fiscal possibilities of the issuer are staggering. It's time that we demand the federal government balance the economy, not the books. So that was that. You know, I'm sorry it was a little bit long. 50 minutes is a long time for you to sit and wait, and thank you very much for joining us for that long. Remember, it's just a different way of thinking about the economy, the accurate way, the way things actually operate. I want you to start thinking about what monetary sovereignty is. What can we really afford if we are no longer constrained by gold or by any kind of currency pay? When they tell us we can't afford something, I want you to think about this video. 
I want you to tune back in next week when we start having real economists come on and start really delving into the nitty gritty about what is really going on in the economy. What can we really do? What can we really afford? I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye-bye.